The late 90s was a golden age for the survival horror genre. Sure, it had its progenitors with games like Sweet Home on the NES or the Alone in the Dark series on PC, but it was 1996's Resident Evil that solidified the genre and brought it to the heights of critical and commercial success. Many imitators followed, with some of them, like Silent Hill, further pushing the boundaries of the genre and creating their own distinct identity. But, like Doom before it with first-person shooters, it was Resident Evil that would become synonymous with survival horror. Capcom created an instant classic by taking the then-current Japanese trend of mansion mystery stories and imbuing it with B-movie horror tropes. And for those who don't know, mansion mystery was a specific term used in Japanese media for mystery stories that were set in Western-style buildings. To those of us outside of Japan, you'd probably just think, yeah, well, that's just a mystery story, like an Agatha Christie locked room kind of thing. But in Japan, it felt very chic and exotic at the time, thus the coining of the mansion mystery phrase. Back to Resident Evil though, the first game saw ports on the PC and the Sega Saturn in 1997, and with other developers jumping on the survival horror bandwagon, Sega felt a bit left out. Sure, they had more experimental fare on the Saturn with the likes of D and Enemy Zero, both of which I've covered in previous videos, but Sega lacked their own title in this newish genre of survival horror. And that's where Deep Fear comes in, Sega's answer to Resident Evil. Deep Fear takes the mansion mystery format and adds dashes of science science fiction and body horror, it's set on an underwater research facility owned by the US military and overrun with mutated crew members suffering from some sort of extraterrestrial infection. Where Resident Evil drew its inspiration from Night of the Living Dead and other zombie features, Deep Fear makes nods to John Carpenter's The Thing and James Cameron's The Abyss. Dubbed a Resident Evil clone on its arrival in 1998, Deep Fear was met with, yeah, it's pretty good, but it's no Resident Evil, kinds of reviews. But now that we're 25 odd years outside of the Resident Evil clone mentality, maybe we can take a look at this game more on its own merits. Is it a lost treasure that deserves to be dredged up from the murky depths of the Saturn's library? Or is it a shipwreck, better left condemned to the dark reaches of Davy Jones's locker? Uh. Uh. <clears throat> Sorry, I let those ocean metaphors get a bit out of hand. Let's just talk about deep fear. Deep Fear is a third-person survival horror game developed by System Saycom, the same System Saycom that developed the first-person adventure game Lunacy for the Saturn, which I've also previously covered on this channel. In the case of Deep Fear, System Saycom had a little help from Sega's own internal CS2 development team. This was meant to be the Saturn's big exclusive entrance into the survival horror genre after all, so adding some extra oomph from its first-party devs was in Sega's best interest. Deep Fear released in the summer of 1998 in Japan and Europe only. Unfortunately, the game wouldn't see a North American release. By that time, Sega of America had ceased support for the Saturn, with Burning Rangers being the final first-party Saturn title released for the platform in that territory. Which is a shame. I mean, the Saturn was almost a failure right out of the gate in the US, with its bungled launch and numerous other issues in the territory. Remember, look for Sega Saturn. It's out there. And by 1998, it had been thoroughly bested in the console wars by the PlayStation and the N64. I am a huge Saturn fan, but I'm not naive enough to think that one game would have saved it. Especially not this one. But it would have been a nice addition to US Saturn owners' libraries. You gotta remember, Resident Evil 2 had just dropped in January of 98. Who are you? What are you doing here? pretty much solidifying the genre as a commercial and critical darling. But unlike the first Resident Evil, the sequel never got a Saturn port. So Deep Fear might have seen a little bit of sales success from Saturn owners thirsty for a survival horror outing on the dying system. But such was the way with the Saturn so much missed potential. Anyway, Sega's first party involvement in the development of the game brought a lot of big names onto Deep Fear's staff. Rieko Kodama was a co-producer. She'd worked as an artist on several of Sega's more celebrated Master System and Genesis titles, such as Alex Kidd and Miracle World, the Fantasy Star series, Altered Beast, 
Shadow Dancer, and the first two Sonic games. She was director of Phantasy Star 4 on the Genesis and Magic Knight Ray Earth on the Saturn. After these successful stints, she spent a few years in Sega management until she was put on the team for Deep Fear. She'd continue on in producer roles for the rest of her career, working on such projects as Skies of Arcadia for the Dreamcast and its GameCube port, Skies of Arcadia Legends, as well as the Seventh Dragon series of games for handheld consoles. Sadly, she passed away in 2022, with Sega including a memorial message dedicated to her in the credits of the Genesis Mini 2. Kenji Kawai was the composer for Deep Fear, and here's a guy who's composed music for more popular anime than you can shake a stick at, including the original Ghost in the Shell films, the Pat Labor films, Ranma Half, the Higurashi franchise, and so much more. His haunting orchestral style fits the overall mood of Deep Fear perfectly. Yasushi Nirasawa was monster designer, and you can find his artwork in the hugely successful Kamen Rider TV series. After his work on Deep Fear, he found more success in the world of gaming, creating concepts and designs for games such as Soul Calibur and Shin Megami Tensei IV, to name a couple of the more well-known ones. Nirasawa also isn't with us anymore, having passed away in 2016. The game's writer, Yuzo Sugano, also went on to work at Sony and wrote and directed the 2001 PS2 game Extermination, which shares some similarities with Deep Fear. So production-wise, Sega put together a stellar team. But what about the game itself? Before we jump into that, I want to give a quick shout out to the Dungeon Dwellers who support this channel on Patreon and through YouTube memberships. And they all get to watch videos early, get exclusive updates from me, and sometimes vote for what games I'll cover next. More polls are coming this year, by the way, I promise. If you'd like to join them, stick around till the end of the video to find out more. In Deep Fear, you take control of popular singer-songwriter John Mayer. No, sorry, that's Mayer as in a city elected official. Well, there goes my fantasy of playing a John Mayer video game. I mean, not that that was ever a real fantasy of mine or anything. <laughs> Body anyway, John Mayer is a safety instructor and former U.S. Navy SEAL who's stationed on board a research facility called The Big Table, which sounds like something straight out of a Kojima game. Emergency Rescue Service, John's employer, is one of several private corporations operating aboard The Big Table, which was originally constructed as an underwater fueling station for the military. However, due to budget cuts, parts of the facility were leased to civilian companies, including Medical Industry a medical device manufacturer, Dynamic Network, a telecommunications company, and Sea Farm, an agricultural firm, thus turning it into an underwater research center. The game opens with a cutscene of a space capsule making re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. We then hear some radio chatter between military personnel who are sent out to recover this mysterious object. This is Rainbird. Eldridge, do we read? This is Eldridge. Floating object discovered, thought to be part of the cage, point in 178 the helicopters drop a location marker and radio for the Sea Fox, a naval submarine, to head up the recovery operation. Underlying this whole scene is Kenji Kawai's incredible score. This opening track really sets a tone. There's something so alien and off-putting about the choral elements combined with the driving percussion in this opening scene. At last, we catch a glimpse of the big table. And here, there's actually a time jump of a few months. But they did absolutely nothing here to indicate that the recovery of the space pod and the transition to this scene are taking place at different times. Documents later on indicate the space pod was recovered on January 5th, 1999, and the events of the game take place on April 1st. Anyway, we meet our main character, John, staring forlornly at a photo of a woman named Stella. Stella. Chief! Yeah. 
So Johns received a call from his emergency rescue service co-worker, Mookie Carver, who ends up using a lot of baseball puns throughout, so I'm guessing he's named after Mookie Wilson, a major leaguer from the 80s and 90s. Anyway, Mookie tells John to meet him in the e-pool area because another crew member, Sharon State, God, these names, is drowning. Right out of the gate, this game is very heavy on cutscenes. I'd say it's about 50% story, 10% combat, and 40% backtracking but we'll get to that. Point is, you'll be watching a lot of cutscenes and be able to marvel at all the wonderful late 90s CG and the hilariously bad voice acting. Chief! I love it. You start out in John's room in the central control deck or CCD area of Big Table. There's an open medical case in here where you can grab first aid sprays. There are three types of sprays in the game, blue, orange, and red, with each color restoring more health. You can hold eight of each in your inventory. But here's the thing. These medical cases that you find, not only here, but in many other spots throughout the game, each hold infinite amounts of sprays that can be replenished at any time. There's also a part in the game fairly early on with a little secret where you can max out on all healing sprays. And this makes the game incredibly forgiving, to say the least. But anyway, John grabs all the sprays he can hold and heads down the ladder to find Mookie and Sharon. Turns out, Sharon Sharon wasn't actually drowning. They were just playing a prank on John. <laughs> what? What's going on? April Fools. <laughs> Did you forget it's April Fools Day? You you know, we don't have time for these fun and games. John seems like the type of guy you could play the same prank on over and over and he'd fall for it every time. What? What's going on? Oh, and these line readings are just incredible. The mood around the big table had been kind of stuffy lately. So I had to play a joke before going crazy. What do you mean, stuffy? You were just transferred here a week ago, so you may not have noticed, but it's been especially stuffy lately. It's stuffy around here. Stuffy how? You know, stuffy. Riveting conversation. So after setting up a few main cast members, we cut back to the Sea Fox submarine, the one that we saw recovering the crashed vessel in the opening. The crew is currently making preparations to leave on a mission. Sea Fox, play ball. This time, Mermaid may be waiting for you. Yeah, I wish. If only they were real mermaids. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What? After this, something goes very wrong. There are gunshots, and the submarine crashes into the Navy area of the Big Table facility. John gets called to the control room. I'd better go. <coughs> Gee, thanks for coughing all over us. Yeah, John's got a bit of a cold. Even in his idle animation, he sneezes when you let him stand still for too long. This becomes an important story detail later on, so it's actually a nice touch that they included this. In the control room, John meets up with Clancy Dawkins, commander of the big table, to get a rundown of the situation. And we're also introduced to Dubois Amalric, the designer of both the Sea Fox and Big Table. I asked Dubois, the designer, to come too. Oh, there's no problem with my Sea Fox system. No accident should have occurred. Oh! Wh why? Why? Why would they do this? What? What? Why? What? I, th I think I'm broken. Oh! So. Anyway, John's told that the Navy is sending SEAL Team 6 to help with the disaster, but they won't be arriving for a while, so Emergency Rescue Service needs to head to the Navy area and assess the damage. The top priority is to find a Dr. Weisberg and also connect the Navy area to the rest of the Big Table. You see, the entire Big Table facility is actually broken up into smaller segments that can be moved around and connected to each other. It's all part of Dubois' ingenious design. <gasps> John tells Mookie that they're heading to the Navy area and to get their vehicle, the Little Shark, ready. An accident in the Navy area. We're the first to go in. You mean we get to go in and check out the Navy secret weapons with our own eyes? Hey, this is no joke, Mookie. You've got an important job to do. I'll fill you in later. I thought John was going to hit him there. So the two of them head out to the Navy area, and after arriving, Mookie just yoinks the key out of John's hand and runs off. So with Mookie out of the way, we gain control of John. We had control earlier, but exploring the Navy area is where most of the game mechanics come into play. First up, we've got tank controls, which should come as a surprise to absolutely no one. I think tank controls are fine. 
Sure, we've come up with more elegant solutions since the 90s, but once you get over the initial weirdness, it all starts to feel second nature. This is just how most older survival horror games controlled, so I really don't have much to say about this. Works well enough. By investigating this yellow box on the wall, John finds out that the oxygen circulation system aboard the Sea Fox is broken. And these boxes will be found throughout the game and also act as save points. But the oxygen circulation system brings us to Deep Fear's big twist on its survival horror gameplay. You'll notice that you have an HP bar in the top left. Self-explanatory. But above that is an air bar, and over on the right is a number that's counting down. This number is a measurement of how much oxygen is left in this particular room. If the number reaches zero, the air meter will begin to fall. And if this reaches zero, then you'll start losing HP. This will be a constant thing throughout the game, but the oxygen in areas can be restored at the yellow boxes. However, this first one in the navy area is broken right now. So we're eventually going to have to fix it. There's a bit more to this mechanic, but we'll come back to it later. John catches up with Mookie at the elevator. You're slow, Chief. I didn't think you were that old. There's that hand that wants to hit again. When Mookie and John arrive at the next floor, they come across an injured Navy officer who hands John a gun and tells him to kill him. John's too slow on the draw, though, and the guy transforms into some kind of creature. So, combat. Much like Resident Evil and other survival horror games that feature guns, you can ready John's weapon by tapping the R button. But here it's a toggle instead of a button that needs to be held. Also, John can walk and run with his weapon ready, giving him more mobility than most survival horror protagonists of the era. We've got our total amount of ammo in the bottom right corner, and the Glock handgun here holds 17 bullets in its magazine, which can only be reloaded automatically by John. There is no manual reload button. As you can probably imagine, this ends up putting you in some dicey situations. The handgun has pretty good stopping power early on, but we'll get some, emphasis on some, very few, more powerful weapons later, like a harpoon gun, an SMG, a shotgun, a gatling gun, and... Well, actually, that's pretty much it. There are more powerful variations of the pistol and shotgun, but yeah, not a large weapon selection. Though you do get some grenades, regular ones and stun grenades, the latter of which can help out with enemies that like to move erratically. There are also air grenades, which aren't used for combat, but can replenish a bit of oxygen in rooms that are low. Anyway, four shots from the handgun will drop the mutated Navy officer, and most humanoid enemies have this crawling animation, but there's no melee or stomp attack to finish them off, so you just have to put another bullet in them. There aren't that many enemy variations throughout the game either. There are different levels of these mutated humanoid enemies. And since there's an agricultural firm on board, we also get some mutated animals as well. There's also this huge bug-like enemy. There are only two in the whole game. They're probably the scariest monsters in Deep Fear though. As I mentioned, some of them like to hop around or move in weird patterns, and it's a real bitch to aim manually. You should definitely go into the options menu and turn on the enemy search function. This allows you to press a button while your weapon is drawn, and John will quickly snap to the closest enemy. Trust me, you'll want this on after trying just a few minutes of combat without it. One last note on combat before we move on. Lots of enemies seem to have invincibility frames after taking damage, so be measured with your shots instead of mashing the fire button, otherwise you'll just be wasting ammo. After dealing with the mutated navy officer, John heads to the nearby storage room and finds a distraught Mookie. Let's go back, Chief! This is bad! We haven't finished our mission. We have to save the doctor. Please, no! You saw how that guy turned into a monster. I'm just realizing this while watching the footage back, but Mookie sounds a lot like Butters. Butters, we heard a rumor that you might have a little girlfriend, Sally Darson. Oh, hell, Dad. I got lots of girlfriends. Sally's just my bottom bitch. Do you know what I am saying? John gets a call from Clancy asking for an update, and after John tells him that one of the survivors turned into a monster, Clancy's just like, a monster, you say? That, that's ridiculous. Anyway, don't forget to rescue the doctor and dock the Navy area. That's not suspicious at all. John tells Mookie to head to the docking area so they can begin connecting the Navy section to the rest of the big table. Also, these green lockers here are where you refill ammo for your weapons. 
There are no ammo pickups in Deep Fear. You find clips and magazines that can expand the total amount of bullets you can carry for each weapon, but these lockers will refill all ammo for all weapons to full. They're found in every storage room, and there are a bunch of storage rooms throughout the facility. So yeah, ammo management is never really a thing you need to worry about in Deep Fear. If you're ever running low, you can always hit up a storage room and just refill completely. Convenient? Yes. Tension breaking in a horror game? You betcha. The infinite ammo combined with the infinite healing items that I talked about before make this game a cakewalk. Enemies hit pretty hard, but you can always pause and heal from your near endless supply of first aid sprays. And the game doesn't have any difficulty settings, so this is it. Anyway, Mookie hands over the key he stole earlier and gets ready to start docking while John goes to find Dr. Weisberg. On the way, I got ambushed and killed by an enemy who fell from the ceiling as I was running by. And this is where I learned, the hard way, that you can mash B to break free of an enemy grab. Enemies can kill you surprisingly quickly if you get grabbed. In the next room, John finds Dr. Weisberg and gets a flash of Stella, the woman from the photograph in the beginning of the game. Which, I mean, I don't really know why. The doctor doesn't really look like the woman from the photo, and they never expand on this little scene here. So, I don't know. There's also a chimpanzee. You can actually hear it making sounds from the other side of the door before you enter this room. <laughs> Now that Dr. Weisberg has been found, Mookie docks the naving area with the rest of Big Table. The monkey runs off, and we get introduced to Danny Reynolds, the foreman of the underwater fueling facility. Whoa, your boyfriend? Just kidding. Dr. Weisberg goes to meet with Commander Clancy while Mookie and Danny head down to park the little shark. On the way to Clancy's office himself, John runs across Dubois, and I will never get over his voice. John, it's a facility check. I have this strange feeling. That doesn't sound too good. Oh, definitely. It's from the air unit area. It's howling at the top of its lungs. I wonder if it's wearing down. The actor's voice is cracking, trying to keep it that high. Back on the Sea Fox, we see one of the dying crew members activate the missile silos. In Clancy's office, Dr. Weisberg has just finished briefing the commander on events in the Navy area and heads back to her room in the medical industry section. And John is understandably a bit upset about witnessing a man transform into a monster. A human being turning into a creature? What's going on in the Navy area? What goes on in there is top secret. Now, I'm afraid I can't answer your questions, but I will say this. The Navy has nothing to do with the creatures. But, but... Anyway, a SEAL team has been called in for the rescue. Until they arrive, the Navy area will be sealed off. Just then, Clancy gets a call and tells John to meet him at the control deck. And here we can talk a bit about actually navigating your way around this game world. I've already mentioned the fact that different private companies and the Navy own and operate different sections of the facility. But beyond that, there are maintenance areas, bathrooms, living quarters, you know, places you'd expect to see in this type of environment. The developers designed the big table as a fairly believable space. Believable as far as the average gamer is concerned anyway. I'm sure there are engineers out there who could tell us why an underwater facility designed this way wouldn't work, but there's enough effort here to make it work for a game. There's a realism and logic to the way things are laid out, and that's impressive. The mid-90s were a time when some developers were really thinking about the layouts of their game settings and attempting to make level design feel less gamey. Resident Evil achieved this with its mansion setting, and then of course the streets of Raccoon City and the police station from the opening of RE2. But then, you know, you've got different keys to open doors represented by suits of playing cards, but that's a whole other thing. The point is the layout. And other games strive for this kind of believability before Resident Evil, especially early Imsims on PC. There is, however, a huge drawback to this more realistic design philosophy, and that's the backtracking. Now, a lot of survival horror games have some form of backtracking. You're running back and forth all over that mansion in RE1. But the difference is, the Spencer Mansion is more compactly designed. Whereas in Deep Fear, the big table is comprised of long hallways, elevator rides, and rooms where you need to pass through other rooms to get where you're going. There are no clever shortcuts. A lot of the design of the environment has you heading deep into a particular area to grab a key item. And once you've accomplished that, you'll have to double back to use that item in the area where you found out you needed it. And this happens with almost every little mission you're sent on throughout the game. The beginning 
beginning of disc two is especially egregious in this regard, and I'll talk about that more when we get to it. I guess this is what it would be like if you had to move through an underwater facility designed this way, but it doesn't make for the most engaging exploration, especially later when it can take you upwards of five to 10 minutes to return to an area after finding a key item with maybe just one or two enemy encounters on the way. And all that serves to do is slow you down since, as I mentioned, there's no need to worry about running low on ammo. It honestly makes the game feel kind of boring to play a lot of the time. It's very easy to get lost too. The environments don't do a lot to differentiate themselves, which again goes with the strive for realism in the design, but doesn't help with navigation. You get an auto map that you have access to at all times that will show you what rooms you've been to and where you are currently, but there are no indications of what the rooms on the map are. So when Clancy says to meet him in the control deck, you don't know where that is especially this early on, so you'll most likely spend a few minutes popping in and out of rooms trying to find the right one. I gotta give credit where credit's due though. I like the pre-rendered backgrounds in Deep Fear. They're filled with detail. Desks with scattered paperwork, lab equipment, charts, notes on walls. I love the era of pre-rendered backgrounds, so all of this just adds to the atmosphere and piles on the charm. Also worth noting is that most of your time spent exploring features no background music, just the ambience of the facility. Footsteps clanging on metal grates, and tapping on tile floors, water dripping from pipes somewhere in the background. Music typically only pops up in cutscenes, boss fights, and more tense moments. Much like the level design though, this is kind of a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, I like the immersiveness of it, but on the other, I mean, come on, you've got Kenji Kawai doing music for your game. Make use of his genius. Anyway, when we finally reach the control deck, we learn that a torpedo is about to be launched from the Sea Fox, and it has a sonar tracking device, so an announcement is made for everyone to be very, very quiet. we just say. But this idiot yelling doesn't even matter because the air unit area of the big table is making noise and the torpedo is locked onto its position. Shit, dude, it's an emotional roller coaster with you. Commander, the Sea Fox missile hatch is what? This is an ROV pitcher. The Poseidon could be launched at any moment. Someone is operating it from inside. My god. There are two control keys on board the Sea Fox that are needed to deactivate the launch, but SEAL Team 6 hasn't arrived yet. And this is where we find out that John used to be a SEAL Team 6 member. Mayor, you were a SEAL Team 6 member, right? Didn't you have training in decoding nuclear missile launches? Uh, yeah, but... I'm sorry, we don't have any time. Get aboard the Sea Fox and take care of the situation. Go now! But, but. Yes, I believe that this stuttering Stanley used to be a member of one of the most elite forces in the US military. But, but. Clancy hands John a weapon card that allows him to go to the storage room and pick up a submachine gun, which is absolute garbage, so don't even bother with it. Mookie has returned with the little shark, but John tells him they need to head out again, this time to the Sea Fox. When they arrive at their destination, Mookie stays put and John goes in alone. He immediately runs across a sick man in the hallway 
hallway, who tells John to find an air regulator to help him breathe in places with no oxygen. A little further down the hall, John witnesses another man suffocate to death. And here we find a yellow box that recharges the air. Should have just held on for a few more seconds. But he's got a Fox key on him, so we'll be taking that. This unlocks the bunk room, which allows us to grab the air regulator and the harpoon gun. The harpoon gun is automatically equipped in underwater areas and is the only weapon you can use in those environments. The air regulator allows John to enter flooded areas and areas with poison gas. It also slows air meter depletion in rooms that are out of oxygen. John will put it on automatically whenever he enters rooms where he needs to use it, which is good, but it can also leave you open to enemy attacks at times. Whenever you use the regulator, your air bar will stay at whatever level it was at when you take it off, but it can be recharged to full at certain yellow boxes. John puts out a fire with a fire extinguisher grenade that we picked up, and this is just a story-specific item. There are no other fires in the game. John heads up the ladder and finds Dallas Silver, the Sea Fox's captain, who tells him that he has one of the control keys needed to stop the torpedo launch, but John will need to go get the other one from a safe inside the officer's quarters. So, fetch, fetch quest time. time. The captain hands over the key to the safe, but it also needs a passcode, which is found on the dog tags of a charred corpse in the room where John used the fire extinguisher grenade. When John heads back to play the control key, a transformed Captain Dallas drops from the hatch and we fight our first boss battle. By now you've probably stocked up a good supply of grenades, so tossing a few and using the handgun should take him down quickly. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Still nothing. John grabs the other control key off the captain's corpse and manages to stop the torpedo launch. What? 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 <laughs> wow. The sea fox is now slipping off the edge of the underwater cliff it's resting on, so John needs to escape through the open torpedo bay. Haha, <laughs> can't get me when I'm in the middle of a ladder climbing animation. As John escapes out into the open ocean, Mookie comes to the rescue. I guess, I guess I'm not as young as I used to be. The blast sank burst. A sad ending for the Sea Fox. Millions of dollars down the drain. Spoken like a true corporate shill, Mookie. The CCD area has been locked down, so they need to head around to the medical industry section. The sick guy from earlier is also on board with them, and ugh, what them fingernails do, though. Okay, well, I think this is a good time to break for spoilers, so if you want to check out Deep Fear on your own, skip to this time, or use the chapter select to get my final thoughts. If you want to listen to me spoil the rest of the game's story, though, just keep watching. Okay. Everybody good? Made your decision? I'm just stalling in case you're watching with captions on so they don't pop up and spoil it before you have a chance to click away. This is your last chance. And... So Mookie fucking eats it. Mookie, my boy, they did you dirty. The little shark goes down, and John says a line here, but they didn't bother to add anything in the English voiceover. I think he just says Mookie's name. And of course, the thing that killed Mookie survived.
The way they hype this up, I thought it was going to be another boss fight, but it's just a normal enemy. After entering the medical industry area, John gets a call from Clancy telling him the SEAL team has arrived. He needs to return to the CCD area, but there's a pesky laser security system blocking the path through one of the storage rooms that leads back there. John meets up with a scientist who tells him that making some insecticide spray will allow them to see the laser beams, which are on the fritz and can be passed through when they flicker off. None of you guys have like a cigarette or some talcum powder? We need to make a goddamn poison poisonous insecticide. After grabbing the chemicals, John takes them back to the room with the scientist to mix them. And this is really the only thing that could actually be considered a puzzle in the game, but it's more like an annoying little mini game. You need to press the buttons for chemical A to stop it on the right number, and then do the same for chemical B. It's kind of frustrating. I kept stopping it like one number short. If you mess up, nothing happens. You just have to try again. Now, you could just make the insecticide right away, but if you fiddle with some other number combinations, you can make infinite supplies of the three healing items in the game. I did this for a full stock of each healing item, and these pretty much carried me through the rest of the playthrough. Using the insecticide in the storage room fills it with poison gas, but John's got an air regulator, so no problem. Now he can see the lasers and make it to the other side of the medical center, where he meets up with Dr. Weisberg again. She reveals that she's been studying the creature cells. They devour the host cells and multiply until the host begins to mutate. Right. This cell transforms into other living things and copies their original characteristics. I've never seen anything like this. I've seen it. A human turning into a creature. The transforming cell eats the original cells at a high speed and eventually takes over the body. Is there anything that can stop it? It, it must have a weak point. Something has to be done, but there isn't enough data. <laughs> Are you done? Sorry. I have had this cold since last night. <laughs> Ugh, God, dude, get a fucking tissue. Dr. Weisberg is intrigued by the fact that John's been attacked by the creatures, but has no sign of transformation. She draws some blood to run some tests. I'll let you know the results. And what are you going to do? I have to get back to the CCD area. The what area? The CCD area. Okay, but to get out of this area, you have to go through the net lock system. And how do I do that? You need the help of an MI area researcher. If you could operate the air system, I could help you. But we can't go out because there's no air. Right. Oh. What about the chimpanzee? Anthony? I can't find him. I'm worried. I love that the chimpanzee's name is Anthony. So John goes and fixes the air system, and when he returns to Dr. Weisberg, she tells him that he doesn't have any parasite cells in his blood, but he does have the common cold. After running some tests on lab mice, she's found that the parasite doesn't attack hosts that are infected with another virus. So this whole time John's been coughing and sneezing has actually served a story purpose, which is pretty neat. <laughs> Weisberg also reveals that the parasite cell is weak to oxygen, so if they keep the oxygen levels high, the parasite cells will weaken. This is a nice tie to gameplay, in theory, but the game doesn't really do anything interesting with it. It would have been neat if enemies were stronger, or you found stronger variations in low oxygen areas, and then when you recharge the oxygen levels, they get weaker, but... Unfortunately, it never does anything like that. Weisberg uses the retinal scanner to unlock the apartments area of the big table for John. Then she stays behind to continue her research, and they share a little moment before parting. Thanks for everything. You're welcome, Dr. Weisberg. Call me Gina. <laughs> okay, Gina. As John enters the apartments, there are some weird cocoon creatures on the ceiling that drop and attack, but they get taken out by a sniper on the second floor, in a scene that's oddly similar to Janine King's introduction in Blue Stinger, another Sega survival horror game. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. Thanks for saving me. Who are you? Wouldn't it be polite if you told me your name first? If you're right, I'm John Mayer, ERS. Rescue Squad? How do I know you're not a creature? I could ask you the same question. I'm coming down. Do I look like a monster? 
In a way, yes. John, such a charmer. This is Anna Lawrenson, a diver that works for Dynamic Network. She tells John that the CCD lock is broken, so he'll need to torch the panel and rewire it. When he asks where he can find a torch, she tells him to find it himself, because she's busy looking for Rambo. Rambo? A bulldog, my companion. I usually let him roam around here. If something happens, he usually returns right away. But in these conditions, I'm worried. So, I don't have time to talk. If we grab a hamburger from the cafeteria, we can use it a little later on to befriend Rambo. God, that dog model. Anna's so happy that John's found Rambo, she tells him that the torch is in the dynamic network area. Of course, she knew this the whole time, so she was just fucking with him earlier. But as consolation, she hands over a spare key. In the apartment area, you also find your first videotape, or VTR as they're called in game. One of the rooms on the second floor allows you to view them, but they're not really anything special. I think there are only two of them in the whole game. The first is a wireframe of Big Table, and the other is a wireframe of the Sea Fox submarine but for completion's sake, I figured I'd mention them. Inside Dynamic Network, we find Ken Fujiyama, one of the most superfluous characters I've ever encountered in a video game. Have you come to save me? Yes, but I have to return to the CCD area. For that, I need your torch. Excuse me, but I can't trust you because you might be a monster. Let's make a deal. A deal? You want this torch. I'll give it you. In return, give me something I can use. I don't have any money. John, he's not a bum, he's Japanese. So Fujiyama sends John on a fetch quest to get some data off of a computer, and in return he'll hand over the torch. Once you complete this task for him, he disappears, never to be seen again. Seriously, I, I don't know how this guy got out of the facility, but he's never seen or mentioned again. He was just a roadblock, because the developers didn't want you to just pick up the torch. Back in the apartments, John uses said torch to open the panel, rewire the door, and return to the CCD area. The SEALs have arrived, and John goes to Clancy's room to get the lowdown on the current situation. In here we meet Colonel McCoy. Long time no see, John. Uh, Colonel McCoy. You know each other. He was one of my men. One of the best. I didn't know that you were hiding here. I thought you were done with the ocean after that day. So it seems McCoy and John have some kind of history, but Clancy interrupts before we can learn anything more about it. McCoy and Clancy are heading into a planning meeting, and civilians aren't allowed, so John is left out. Back in his own room, Sharon is waiting. Mayor, you're safe. I was so worried. Yeah, I'm alright. But Mookie, it's because I wasn't there. Actually, you were standing right outside the sub. Sharon seems like she's about to make some sort of confession, but before she can, Gina enters. What? Oh, what's the matter, Gina? Mayor, I got kind of scared, so I came here. Oh. oh boy, a threesome. This is Dr. Weisberg, the MI area lead researcher. Nice to meet you. I'm Sharon State. Nice to meet you, too. Mayor, you, you don't look too happy. Yeah, I met someone I didn't want to meet. What? Colonel McCoy, my former commander. I was in a lot of special missions under him. The team almost got wiped out once, but because of his actions and bravery, we were saved. I just barely survived. Anything was possible with Colonel McCoy. But that day, Stella, Colonel McCoy's younger sister, I killed her. She was my fiance. Do you want to tell me about it? You shouldn't keep it locked up inside. Mayor, you saved me before. Now it's my turn to help you. Um, I think I'm in the way, so I'll leave. Don't just give up, Sharon. Ah, never gonna get that threesome. So John tells Gina the story of how Stella died. First day off in a while. The weather was pretty nice. There was a storm coming, but I was confident in my yachting skills, and I ignored Colonel McCoy's warning. We took Stella out on the ocean. The yacht was swept into the storm. To a storm, the yacht was like a leaf in the wind. Stella was thrown out into the ocean. I tried to save her. But there was nothing I could do. And only I survived. Colonel McCoy said nothing to me. That made it even worse. I couldn't handle the guilt, and I left the team. Oh. Even if I wanted to forget it, I, I can't. It'll take time. As time passes, you'll come to understand each other, I'm sure. This is too bad, man! Come to my room as quickly! It's terrible! 
Oh my god, Dubois, you sure know how to kill a moment. Or punctuate it. I don't know which. So this high-talking motherfucker is eavesdropping on the planning meeting. He's put a hidden camera in the conference room. The SEAL team's plan is to put the monsters in the air unit, somehow. Let's show those monsters what SEAL are made of! Let's get moving! Get the gondola ready! The gondola? Oh, they're full of it. Those navy muscle heads shutting me out and starting this mess! God, that voice, I'll never get over it. Dubois explains the obvious, that it's really dumb to fight the monsters in the air unit. You know, the thing that supplies oxygen to the entire facility. Setting aside all the joking, it really is unbelievable how dumb this plan is. What kind of elite special operations team would come up with something so stupid? So Dubois says they need to tell Clancy that this plan could not only cause the big table to lose all oxygen, but it could also cause a blowout that would impact the Navy ship sitting on the surface above. Commander. We call the SEAL team at once. Why? If the area unit is damaged in the battle, the air pressure will explode the big table. You must call them back. Oh, damn. Nobody but Dubois thought of that. Clancy tries to contact the SEAL team, but the signal doesn't go through. So he sends John to call them back. Apparently, the SEALs have locked the door to the docking area where the gondola is, and we run into Danny. As he's futilely kicking at the door, trying to get it open, John uses the key card he just got from Clancy and unlocks it. Wow, it opened. What? You were here? Before heading to the gondola, we can go visit Sharon. She's in the sea farm area with the dolphin. John? Sorry, I was half asleep. <laughs> you must be tired. How's it going? The work is good, but I can't sleep at night. <laughs> Are you in love? What? Of course not. John, this dolphin likes me a lot. It's good to be liked by everybody. Who ever said that? Uh, so, okay, wh whatever. Fucking waste of my time. John runs back to the docking area where Danny has the gondola ready. The gondola is back in place. And he rides it out to the air unit area, where the seals are just shooting at the walls. But the music in this cutscene is great, so I'm just gonna let it play. John arrives to find the SEAL team members dead, and he's got no qualms about patting down their bodies for supplies. In the room where he disengages the locking mechanism, there's a guy that is clearly still alive, but John doesn't even bother to interact with him. Well, I've done what I came here to do. See you, buddy. There's a little jump scare in this hallway as a body falls from the ceiling. What a tragic end. He bled to death. Oh, is that all? In the air storage room, we face off against the game's second boss, this little jumpy rat fucker. Stun grenades help to hold it in place for a bit so you can blast it with the shotgun. After that's taken care of, John notices a bomb on the ground attached to the air supply. He's got three minutes to get the hell out, and that's more than enough time. I also like how this intense music pauses for the elevator cinematic. John gets back on the gondola, or sorry, gondola, as the bomb explodes, destroying the air unit and sending a huge blast up to where the Navy ships are sitting. So John not only failed to stop the SEALs, he also failed to stop their plan of blowing up the air unit area. Great job. It's pretty cool how they show the jet being crushed by the water pressure. That's a nice detail. The jet narrowly misses the main big table facility, but it crashes into the energy unit area, knocking out all power. Electric cable 
has been cut! Gee, you think? The base switches over to reserve power and John returns in the gondola. Danny tells him that Colonel McCoy returned covered in blood, but before John can find out where he went off to, he gets called by Clancy back to the CCD area. And this brings us to the end of Disc 1. Disc 2 begins with John making his way to the control deck, where Clancy waxes philosophical about the view and his past. I spent most of my life in a submarine. But the government looks at one mistake and cuts me off from my dreams by locking me up in this ocean floor prison. One mistake? Oh, one of the submarine missiles I launched hit a passenger ship. Oh, is that all? So Clancy curses the military for banishing him to the big table for accidentally sinking a passenger ship with a missile. It was an honest mistake. Why does bad luck seem to follow me around? Yeah, why don't you try asking that to all those innocent people that you killed on that passenger ship, huh? Turns out the energy unit area is about to melt down on account of being hit by a jet. And Clancy says the only option for escape is to use the SEAL's DSRV, so he tells John to gather all the survivors while Clancy gets the vehicle ready. When John tells Danny that everyone is evacuating, Danny says he doesn't want to leave because he doesn't trust Clancy. He also reveals that Clancy sinking that passenger ship wasn't an accident, and he knows this because he was the sonar officer who warned Clancy that the passenger ship was approaching. John just brushes the whole thing off though. Anyway, get ready to escape. And Danny suddenly changes his mind about escaping. That was easy. John is also trying to get to the energy unit area to get to Dubois, who went down there to assess the situation. But to do that, he needs to head back through the sea farm area. Then Danny notices the torch John is carrying. Wait, what have we here? A torch. With this, I can torch the airlock door. Can I borrow this? Sure. Leave the area lock up to me, is what I'd like to say. But this is out of gas. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So now we need to head back to Sea Farm to get some fuel for the torch for Danny, which means heading back through the CCD area, where we just were when we were talking to Clancy. In Sea Farm, we run into Sharon again, who gives us the passcode to the elevator to the energy unit area, but she also wants to set the dolphin free. Then we have to set this child free. Will it take long? Yes, because the power's out. The sequence is complicated and I have to go to the control room. Hurry! Will you just shut the fuck up and set this dolphin free? So John heads through Sea Farm. There's a cow down there too. Okay. John uses the code Sharon gave to access the elevator, but the elevator isn't working. Of course. But in the storage room nearby, John finds the fuel for the torch, and now we need to take that back to Danny. So back through Sea Farm, through CCD, back to the apartments, up to the floor where Danny's standing in front of the door. Here's your stupid fuel, asshole. You couldn't have gone and grabbed it yourself? This whole jog back and forth took almost 10 minutes, and there were only two enemies along the way. Danny says since the Sea Farm elevator's not working, the only way to access the energy unit area is by walking on the ocean floor. And for that, we'll need something called a big gym suit, a diving suit. Luckily, John's already met a diver who can help him out with that. Danny fixes the door, so now we can access the dynamic network area. Then he gets all sentimental. I have a favor to ask, John. If you see Anna, could you tell her that she doesn't need to act so macho? She's uh, cute if she's quiet. Tell her yourself. This whole thing's so fucked up. If I could, I wouldn't be asking you. Okay, I'll tell her. John's such a pushover. When we find Anna in her room, John relays the message. I have a message from Danny. He says, you don't need to act so macho. You're cute if you're quiet. That rude geek. Ha, <laughs> good for her. So then John asks about the big gym diving suits, and Anna tells him to follow her to the other room where they're kept. One of them is missing though, probably taken by Dubois, and the second one doesn't have an air tank. So guess what? Fetch quest, quest time. time. The air tank is in this flooded room inside a locked compartment, but because of the water pressure, it can't be opened. And we can't drain the water because there's a slash in the wall. We need to investigate both the slash in the wall and the compartment before returning to Anna and telling her the room is flooded. She then says to visit Danny in his room in the apartments and ask about the gum gun device to seal the leak. If we don't go back and talk to Anna first though, Danny's room will be locked and we can't get in. And all of this involves lots of hallways, elevator rides, and door transitions since the room with the air tank is on a different floor than the big gym room where Anna is. John enters Danny's apartment and examines a photo on his desk. That's my family. Sorry. I didn't mean to snoop. It's okay. I was supposed to be on that with my family. 
You don't get to see your family for several months when you're on a submarine. Family, family, family. So Danny was supposed to go on a tour with his family, but an emergency call forced him to the big table. He didn't hear about the accident that killed his wife and daughter until two months later when he returned to the surface. After that, he quit the military, but somehow he couldn't stay away and got a civilian job on the big table working as the foreman in the docking area. This also reunited him with Clancy, whom he had worked with as a sonar officer during the passenger ship incident. But anyway, Danny he tells John the gum gun is in the Navy area. So, looks like we're heading back there now. If we go to check on Anna first, we find her in her room, shivering. All she asks is if we found the gum gun yet. Oh no, is Rambo shivering too? Don't you die on me, dog. So we go and meet Danny, head down to the Navy area, grab the gum gun, return to the apartments, then to the dynamic network area, and to the flooded room. John uses the gum gun to seal the slash in the wall, and I don't think they could have found a more stock sounding effect for this. Now, John can go down to the second floor, refresh the air system, and then head back up to the third floor, where the room that was just flooded will now be drained of water, allowing him to open the compartment where the air tank for the big gym is kept. <sighs> I'm getting lightheaded. The backtracking in this game really wears on you, and the whole first half of the second disc is so mind-numbing because of it. Back downstairs to attach the air tank to the big gym, and we need a diver's license to get the suit free from its bindings. So let's go check on Anna again. Come here, Rambo. What's the matter? Uh-oh. Why are you so scared? <laughs> oh, don't bark so much. I've got you. What's wrong? Uh, John, <laughs> I... My body feels strange. Could you turn on the light? After the fight with Anna, John grabs the license from her corpse. And we can't even take Rambo with us? What are we gonna do, just leave him there? Damn it. John uses the license car on the big gym suit, and now we can finally cross the ocean floor. But, whoop, Anna's still alive. Man, I sure hope Rambo's okay. So walking on the ocean floor sounds like a really cool thing. I was imagining a semi-open underwater area. But in reality, it's just a short Cajun and hallway with these fucking barracudas nipping at you. And don't even bother trying to shoot them with the little harpoon gun on the Big Jim's arm. They're like impossible to hit. They only do damage to the Big Jim's oxygen supply. And this area is really small anyway, so it doesn't even matter. It's just an annoyance. In the energy area, John meets up with Dubois. Oh, oh, man, I hurt my leg. I can't walk by myself. I have a favor to ask. What? The meltdown is caused by heat combustion. That fallen harrier broke a pipe and the cooling water isn't getting to the energy chamber. I think it'll return to normal if the coolant starts flowing again. And? It won't budge. You should be able to open the coolant tank valve from here. What can be done? The only way is to go to the coolant tank and open the valve manually. Can you do it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big strong dude. The valves won't budge because they're all gunked up with God knows what that is. So Dubois suggests blowing up the main coolant tank instead. To do that, John needs to go to the explosive storeroom and grab some C4. Fetch, Fetch quest time. time. Get in the big gym, get eaten by barracudas, and use the code Dubois just gave to enter the storeroom. Inside is Colonel McCoy, looking a bit worse for wear. Colonel McCoy? Stay where you are! Listen from there. The time I have left is short. N no. Yes, my body is being taken over by a creature. He says that like it's just a rash or something. Slap some cream on it, clear that right up. So McCoy forgives John and gives him his gun that seems to float over to John's foot through some kind of paranormal means. It's a Colt M M1991 A1. It's from my father's generation. The pride of a strong America. Did he just fart? The pride of a strong America. As John leaves the storeroom in the big bulky gym suit, McCoy sets off the explosives. They play this up as a big emotional scene, but all I could think was, God, I hope this explosion kills these goddamn barracudas.
In an act of mercy though, the game sets you back in the energy unit area where you need to go. The big gym is out of order though, damaged by the blast. After John sets the C4 on the coolant tank, he returns to Dubois, who doesn't look so hot. Oh, oh, the last thing to do is to escape. John, can I push the detonator? The building is like my child. I have to do it. It's all yours, you fucking weirdo. So Dubois hits the button and blows the coolant tank, flooding the overheating energy area with water. A tunnel leads back to the big table from here, but Dubois stays behind since he knows he's done for. <laughs> I've made up my mind, John. Get out of here. I don't want to hurt you. I will open the tunnel door for you with the remote. But, but hurry and go! Why? Why? And John's just like, yeah, okay, buddy. Dubois transforms, and as John makes his way through the tunnel, he's attacked by him. He hangs from the ceiling and moves pretty fast, but he stops every now and then, and the tunnel is pretty long, so you got plenty of space to fight. This isn't the end, though. In the flooded area beyond, Dubois attacks again, and you have to fight this awkward underwater battle. Dubois is more mobile than John is, so it's better just to stand still and space out your harpoon shots. He'll scream like a bitch and float to the top when he dies. This tunnel leads to the sea farm area, where John runs into Sharon again. She couldn't move the last lever to open the dolphin tank, so John, who according to Dubois is a real man, pulls the thing, and Sharon runs off to set the dolphin free, but immediately gets attacked by the cow that was in here that's now mutated. Be careful. The dolphins. Please save them. Come on, Sharon. Let's go back to land together. When you get back. What? Would you have an ice cream with me? Of course. Oh my god, these line deliveries. This cow really packs a punch, too. Once you take it down, you can check Sharon's body for the key to her room. There's not much in here, but you can read her diary, where she writes about how much she loves John. There's also this. Among the pictures of the dolphins, there's a picture of myself. <laughs> I don't know why, this just made me laugh really hard when I first stumbled across it. It's just so silly. Last thing to do in Sea Farm is honor Sharon's dying wish and free the dolphin. Go, or Sharon's life will be wasted. That's it? John just comes in and yells at it? I thought we had to open a hatch or something. Back in the docking area, John runs into Gina and Anthony. Are we clear from the meltdown danger? Yes, but I couldn't save everyone. I think you're doing wonderful, John. You do know that pretty much everyone he's been sent to rescue or has interacted with has died, right? Damn, I think I caught a cold. Aw, oh, now Danny's fucked up, and Anthony is freaking out. Gina leaves to take Anthony back to the rescue services room, but before she goes, she reveals that the parasite cells are evolving. Danny says he's heading off to the Navy area while John goes to CCD. When he gets to the E-pool, he finds Commander Clancy inside the SEAL team's DSRV, escaping on his own. He also finds Gina, who was knocked down by Clancy, in his haste to escape. Wait, Clancy! What do you mean? He can't hear you, Johnny boy. Clancy's escape doesn't last too long, though. I can't end my days here. I need to get the back at the people in Washington who treated me like a criminal. The survivors. I can't let them live. He's just really beating on him, isn't he? Yeah, get him. So that's the end of Clancy. Danny calls John and tells him to come back to the docking area. When John gets there, Gina is alone. Apparently, Anthony freaked out again and ran away, and Danny went to chase him down. But he returns almost immediately with Anthony, and then enters the control room for the platform. But as he's about to press the button to send it down, Anna bursts through from the ceiling and attacks him. Danny! I 
know if it's John or Danny who says that, but it's a weird line because everyone is pretty still in this scene. Danny tells John to back off and go down the lift with Gina, and John's just like, fucking whatever, man, tossing his head with that attitude of his. Anna, it's the first time you've ever come to me. What? How did John not make it out the door in that amount of time? He was standing right by it. <laughs> Gina just waves as the platform descends. Yeah, see ya. Oh, Rambo, thank God. With Rambo in his arms, John jumps down to the descending platform, and he and Gina arrive in the Navy area. This is the final part of the game, so we're back where it all started. In the control room, Gina fires up the controls and begins to drive the Navy area away from the rest of the big table. The air pressure is dropping within the facility, causing ceilings to break and windows to crack, flooding the whole place with seawater. The entire big table facility ends up being destroyed, and the resulting shockwave flips the Navy area upside down. John comes to first and goes to check on Gina. Gina, wake up! Mm. John, what happened? The Navy area seems to be have flipped over. Wait, what did he just say? The Navy area seems to be have flipped over. Seems to be have flipped over? I guess the scriptwriter made a typo and the voice actor decided to just take that at face value. John tries to call for help with the wireless transmitter, but the radio is busted. And when Gina realizes that Anthony is missing, John gets jealous. Anthony's gone. Why? Do you worry about Anthony so much? I'm pretty sure John's voice actor has just given up at this point. Come on, buddy, we're almost done. You can make it. Gina talks about how she and Anthony were similar because they never had any friends. Gina says that there should be parts to repair the radio nearby, so John tells her to stay put while he goes to look for them. While hunting down the parts, John stumbles across a document called The Deep Blue Project, part one of two, with a foreword signed by Commander Clancy. The rest of the document, written by Gina, mentions a space pod recovered near the Marianas Trench that's thought to be one of the lost crafts from Project Mercury, the United States' first attempts at launching living beings into space. These pods were launched throughout the 50s, with this particular one being launched in 1959, 40 years before the events of the game. And this is the same space pod that we saw crash in the opening cutscene. Inside the pod was Anthony, in a near-death hibernation state. Gina then spent two weeks running tests on Anthony. This is where the whole time jump thing I mentioned in the beginning comes from. Those opening scenes just don't communicate very well that the recovery of the space pod and the beginning of the game are taking place at different times. Anyway, Gina's tests reveal that Anthony managed to stay alive for so long thanks to a parasite-like bacteria that multiplies and destroys the original cells in the host's body. If this is the case, how did Anthony manage to not transform? Gina doesn't have any answers in this document, but she mentions at the end that the parasite cell is very similar to primitive parasites found on Earth. After finding all three parts for the radio, John returns, fixes the radio, and makes a distress call. SOS! Requesting a rescue team immediately! Two survivors and one- over! What? One what? Now he's not even reading all the lines. What I actually think is happening here is John didn't tell the rescue team about Anthony because he's jealous of the chimpanzee. Either way, they got the message, and the rescue team is on the way. But Gina has disappeared, so John goes to look for her. Along the way, you can stop by a storage room and grab a Gatling gun. This will make the final boss a complete pushover. There's a computer set up in the corner of one of the rooms with the second part of the Deep Blue Project document open. Gina reveals in this report that the parasite cell is similar to the VMH-117 bacteria, a harmless and common bacteria found in most primates. But the bacteria is easily affected by strong radiation. Gina hypothesizes that the prolonged exposure to mass 
massive amounts of radiation that Anthony succumbed to while being stuck in space for 40 years mutated the bacteria into the parasite cell. The PC, as she calls it, can slow the host's metabolism and expand its lifespan. Gina hopes to turn this parasite into a technology that can be used to facilitate interplanetary travel or to put people with terminal illnesses into a state of hibernation until a cure is found. The drawback, though, is the parasite destroys the original host cells. Gina's hoping to run more tests, but of course, the parasite infecting the crew of the big table curbed any further research. One thing these documents don't explain is how Anthony managed to not transform. Maybe because he was the original host that the bacteria mutated in? I'm not sure. The one thing this document brings to light, though, is that Gina knew what was going on this whole time. Uh-oh. Gina then goes on to explain everything we just read in the documents. I guess in case you missed the first one, you could very easily run through the room that it's in without finding it. Gina does expand on the fact that it was Clancy who came up with the idea for the Deep Blue project, as he thought it was something that would allow him to return to Washington, you know, after he was condemned to the big table for blowing up that passenger ship. Oh, one of the submarine missiles I launched hit a passenger ship. And we saw how that turned out. So we've learned all of this nefarious, politically motivated monkeying around, and John decides that the best one to blame for all of this is the chimp. Because of him, the people at the big table died. He spread the parasite cell. It's just instinct for him to save his kind. He didn't mean harm. If you don't mean harm, does that mean you can do anything you want? I think John's just a little bit too stupid to keep up with this discussion. We're talking about a chimpanzee, bro. I understand how you feel, but he can't be allowed to live or taken back to land. Stop, John, please. We're all... No, no. I guess Gina just decides now to assume her final form, so she goes all Tetsuo and turns into a gelatinous blob. The Gatling gun makes quick work of the first form. You don't even have to move. Afterwards, Gina evolves into an angel-like creature. She moves around a bit more now, but grenades and the Gatling gun take care of her easily enough. And I have so many first aid sprays that I don't even move around much. In her final moments, Gina seems to regain her human mind and gives John the key to the self-destruct system. So for one final bit of backtracking to totally kill the momentum here, John runs to the room where the self-destruct system is, places the key, then runs all the way back to the room where he fought Gina. This is such a terrible way to end the game. Couldn't it have been that Gina initiated the self-destruct herself, or it started up automatically, or Anthony did it, or Ronald McDonald himself came down from heaven and started that motherfucking self-destruct sequence? Literally, Anything else would have been better than making us run back and forth across this final area that we've already been back and forth through like three times at this point. But hey, John says his goodbye to Gina, but Anthony, that little bitch, tries to get inside the pod with him. Oh my god, why did they have him making that face? That's horrifying.
Gina stops him though, and she deflates while holding him as John makes his escape. But wait a minute, where is Rambo? 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 Oh, thank God. As the credits roll, we see that the dolphin is also okay. John surfaces and is picked up by the rescue crew, and we get one last look at those pale gray eyes before the end. What a face to end on. Deep Fear is impressive in its attempt at making the big table feel like a real place. But the problem is the design and pacing of the game. Most of it boils down to fetch quests that have you running back and forth through areas with nothing to do in between. The game took me about 8 hours to finish on a first playthrough, and I think with tighter level design and less pointless tasks, it would have been like 5 hours. Which is perfect for a survival horror game. The level design is bad, and makes backtracking the main focus of the game. Again, I get the attempt at thinking out what an actual actual underwater base would be designed like, but because of this, you spend more time doubling back through empty hallways than you do fighting enemies or bosses. But then when enemies do show up, Deep Fear lacks the tension that the best games in the survival horror genre excel at. It gives the player too much of an edge with its ammo replenishment system and virtually infinite supply of healing items. More thought should have gone into how to make the player feel vulnerable. But even though there were some frustrating and monotonous bits, I don't feel like it's a bad game. Its mechanics are well designed, and its presentation is up to par with other games of the era. It has an interesting story, bad voice acting, which is a positive in my book, and an excellent soundtrack. There were some real creative powerhouses on its development team, but they just couldn't pull it together into a great game. Now, I'm not going to be as lazy as the contemporary reviewers and say that this game is just a Resident Evil clone. System Seicom and Sega were striving for something different here with the underwater setting and the oxygen mechanics, but they just didn't go far enough with these things to make it stand tall. Deep Fear is a curiosity that's worth looking into on the Saturn, but it is not the rival to Capcom's survival horror masterpiece that I'm sure Sega was hoping for it to be. I don't know, I don't think I'd ever want to play it again. Whereas, I could boot up the first Resident Evil and play through the whole thing in one go. I'm just glad they didn't forget about the dog. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please like it, leave a comment, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that yet. I love covering these weird old games, so there are many more of these kinds of videos on the way. If you really like what I do, and you want to give a little extra, I have a Patreon and YouTube memberships. Patreon link is in the description below, and there's a join button for YouTube memberships on this video page. People supporting me in those ways really does a lot for me. I want to just continue focusing as much of my time as possible on making videos, and Patreon and YouTube memberships contribute to making that possible without me having to worry about the algorithm and all that. So please consider joining if you can or if you're interested. Everyone who does gets to watch videos a few days early. They also get updates from me. Uh, there are going to be more polls for what videos I cover. I did one last year, but I'm planning on doing more this year. I just had a few videos that I definitely wanted to get out in this first part of the year. But yeah, if you donate $5 or more, you get your name read out loud at the end of videos like these Dungeon Architects. Antichrist Alex, Benefer94, David Carr, Goats and Goblins, Half HP, High Food Court, Izzy Lexus, Justin Darnell, Meridian, Nick Wolf, Nekot the Brave, Richard Cutting, Stefano Urenia, White Like Eyes, and Tentabat. As well as these dungeon connoisseurs, Adon, Anjan01, Bunzo, Churm Slurm, 
Chiral Spiral, Crippler Jones, Dazed Clockwork, Dika Dico, Glitter Throat, Indigo Happy, Irregular Rob, J Bud Airline, Gemma, Joe Goth Er, Joshua Weber, Minced Meat, Mr. Independent, Nicholas Polstar, Noel the Monkey, Old Dead Lemons, Please Keep Making Videos, Pretty Cody, Prince Goof, Rainbows 98, Rez, Ribbon Black, Samuel Pandiangan, Samurai 85X, Slowbro is Loafing Around, Solar, True Axiom, Tuesday Twin, TV's Brent, Warrior Song, Where Am I, Help, and Zach Diedrich. Thank you all for your support, and once again, thank you for watching. Next video is going to be on Shadow Tower and Shadow Tower Abyss. I'm covering both in the same video. The more I thought about it, the more it didn't make sense to break it up into two videos. I don't know. It just makes more sense to me to do both those games in one big video. So, yeah, I'm working on that, and I'll see you when it's done. It won't be too long of a wait, though. But, yeah, until then, Deep Fear. Check it out. Dungeon Chill. Out. Out.